We got it. <laughs> All righty. Sorry for that interruption. Al, if you want to turn me down just a little bit, uh, it should just be the slider. Slide it down just a little bit because um, we are a little loud here. Thank you. And so again, thank you for those that are with us in the live stream. Apologize for that difficulty. Now everything is is uh, correct. The world is round. It's not flat and we're good to go. So uh, let's go ahead and if you have a bulletin, go over some special announcements here. And uh, really just looking at what we mentioned Sunday and going forward here. And so th this coming Sunday, as we've talked about, especially in our church family, we've had uh, emails sent out. And so we'll be having a special business meeting this coming Sunday night. And uh, that will kind of take place over the normal evening service. And so we just want to be respectful of everybody's times and commitments there. And so we will just be having our one morning live stream service. And uh, if you're wondering why we're not going to be connected live stream, that is why. So we'll be having a special business meeting come Sunday night. For those of us in our church family, just keep on a lookout for uh, email here in the next couple of days, and we'll go over some of the specifics of uh, what that business meeting will include and kind of how your involvement can be expected uh, going forward into that. And then also talking about some adjusted preaching schedules. Uh, if Since I am here, that means the baby's not here. <laughs> since I am here tonight, the baby is not here, and so uh, we are taking that on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, we are now down to days, and the doctor said, you know what, just trying to hold, hold your seat, and just whenever you're ready, you're ready. So uh, we're looking forward to that. So looking forward ahead, we've already made mention to our church body, but if you're friends with us watching on the live stream service, uh, we are expecting, of course, our first child. And so when she will be born, we're going to be taking a couple weeks to uh, get acquainted with her and her acquainted with us in the real world and just trying to play safe and be safe about it. So uh, we have a couple of speakers from inside the church and we're looking outwards as well for some friends to assist us during that time. So just look, look forward to some upcoming adjustments in the preaching schedule. And I would love to say that, uh, you know, we can plan that accordingly, but that's really all on Alina at this time. And so uh, we're just going to take that day by day and, and adjust it around that uh, timing of that. But that really is all the announcements that we have. We Thank you for your continued faithful giving and our faith promises and general offerings. And if you have not yet done so this week, uh, we have our offering basket there in the table. And of course, we always are accepting the online giving with the Venmo as well. And uh, we're incorporating that in our new website that we'll be launching here in the next month or two. And that'll just make it easier for folks to online give as well, uh, if the Lord lays that on your heart. And so that's all of our special businesses, or I'm sorry, uh, announcements to make. If you, again, as we always do in our midweek service, if you have a prayer request or know somebody that has a prayer request, uh, go ahead and shoot them a text. Or uh, if you have one with our Facebook friends there, go ahead and message us or even text me or Allie or somebody here at church that you know is here. And uh, we would be glad to pray with you and over you uh, in the next few moments, really in the next half hour. And when we get into our corporate prayer, uh, we'll, we'll join with your prayers as well. So uh, look forward to that, as we always do on our Wednesday night services. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and go to God's Word and see what He has for us this evening. If you have your Bible with you today, go ahead to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. We'll be started there. And of course, uh, nothing new under the sun, as old Solomon says, but we are continuing our series with God's promises. And I think we'll be having a few more weeks of that. Uh, got a few more promises left that, I, that, I, that uh, I've been reading about and kind of studying over and thinking very practical for our lives. But here is a promise tonight, and that promise is God's promise when we are in need. When we have a need, God makes certain promises to us in the journey of our life. When there comes a point in our life where we have a need from Him or just a general need, there is promises in the Bible specifically from God that God handles, that God responds, that God delivers to our life. And so we'll be looking at that tonight. But before we begin, straight looking at His promises, of course, there are verses will always be various, and uh, they'll be up in the PowerPoint for your convenience. But Isaiah 58 is where we're going to be started. But before we get into the Word, I want to ask you a question, a couple of questions. Have you ever been in a situation where you absolutely need something? 
I mean, you, you, just a situation where life cannot go on unless you absolutely need that very thing. And, uh, you know, I'm not talking about what your taste buds are telling you. Every time I ask my wife, what do you want for dinner? It's usually the words, I need this. Not I want, not, well, this is what I'm thinking. You know, usually she has something very specific and the verbiage need comes out. But it's not that. Uh, but I'm talking about a situation where there's but one solution, an item or a service that you need. And without it, you can't go on. I know for many of us, we can probably relate to that with uh, maybe a car accident or a flat tire or out of gas. And I, I've, in my short life, I've been in all three of those already. I've been in a car accident and totaled my first pickup truck and uh, my first vehicle really on black ice. That's the thing. You know, when I was 18, I didn't think black ice was a thing. But sure enough, it can do damage. And uh, I needed a tow truck. I needed somebody to take me home because I wasn't going to be walking on I-465 to south side of Indianapolis, Greenwood area. Um, I, needed a, I needed gas at times. And I needed my tire aired up just even here recently because I could not go on. And so we've, we, we encounter situations during the life where we need a service or an item. Without it, we can't go on. But now, what if you were on the other hand and how often have you encountered a situation where you had the opportunity to supply someone's need? And oftentimes we can think mechanical as well if you have jumper tables or you have something that a person needs, but maybe it's just an extra dollar for somebody that's scrambling to find a dollar in their purse or their wallet to pay for food right in front of you. You know, you've been in a situation where somebody had a need and you say, you know what, I can provide for that need. But the truth is very often in our lives, we need things. If we were to break it down and we could find things in all aspects of our lives today where we need things yearly, we need things monthly, and we need things daily, and we need things even hourly. Uh, for all of us as human creatures, we need air to breathe, you know, every single minute of our lives. But God's grace supplies our need all the same, continuously. So what happens when a child of God finds themselves in need of God's help in their journey or they won't go on? The Bible gives us many answers to how God promises to supply his need. And so let's go ahead and ask the Lord specifically to bless our reading of his word tonight and see how his promises can meet our needs. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, we want to go before the throne of grace one more time. And Lord, we just want to pray practically and quickly here tonight, Lord. And as we approach your word, Lord, help us to understand it clearly. Help us, Lord, to allow the word as it's read and as it's understood, to apply in our hearts, to be important or impertinent in our hearts, to allow the Holy Spirit to work on in our hearts, to kind of stay in our hearts, Lord, and the Lord for allow us to glean something from it, Father. Lord, we pray that as we read the word, and Lord, we know that all word is profitable unto us, but we pray that specifically the word read tonight will be applicable, will be, will be practical, will be a blessing to the hearers of it as well. Lord, we pray in this, and all these things, we give you the thanks for what you're about to do, even in the reading of your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first promise that we see in God's word in Isaiah 58, and also in another verse, is a provisional promise. The provisional promise. And so in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 11, we read that the Lord is talking to the, to the Jews at this time, and specifically to Israel, and he says in a very specific way, The Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a water garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. And we also see a New Testament principle, or a New Testament verse that supports a provisional promise from God, and that's in Philippians 4.19, where it says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And so in Philippians 4, 19, we see that. And I'll, break, I'll, I'll uh, go back to Isaiah 58 here in just a moment. But really staying with Philippians 4, 19, we see that we serve a God who promises to supply your needs. In this season of harvest, we see the hand of God always fulfilling his promise, do we not? I don't know about you, but uh, I've, I've definitely seen hundreds and tens, and I don't want to say thousands at this point, but hundreds of acres all throughout the greater area here of uh, southwest 
Indiana. And really, outside of probably spraying some fertilizer, outside of planting it where it needs to be planted and where rain can get to it, I don't think farmers much have control of the seeds coming out of the ground, do they? They're dependent on God's grace and on the weather. And thank the Lord that we've had fair weather this year, that we're able to have a good harvest. I know especially last year it was a different story. There was a lot of rain and a lot of damage there. But in the season of harvest, regardless, we see the hand of God always fulfilling that promise. We see, uh, we see it very visibly. And as a race of humans, God always supplies I was thinking about that here just recently and thinking, you know what? In the thousands of years, the human race as a whole never starved to extinction, never starved to near extinction, uh, never had to worry about lack of water. As a whole, we have always been provided for thousands of years. And there's, there is a problem when humans interfere, do not get me wrong. We can see that all throughout the world when, where humans interfere in the ecosystem and damage happens and people have problems. I'm not saying that there is without problems. But in general, this verse is practical and God always provides. He is the great supplier of our needs in all various forms. And I was thinking about all your needs. Every single need God can supply for. And so I just wrote a quick list of what some of those needs are for not necessarily myself personally, but needs of folks who are in people's lives and journey of life and what sometimes our need is. So God is the supplier and he can meet your medical need. He can meet the need of food. He can meet your financial need. He can meet your physical need. He can meet your emotional need. He can meet your spiritual need. He can meet your generational need. He can meet your economical need. He can meet your material need and much more. God is the great supplier of our needs. And I know there's folks that are dependent on, on having children and having the generation and having their kids to take care of them or parents to be a sister or something like that. God promises to supply. There is medicine out there that people need. God promises to supply. There is food out there that people need. God promises to supply. And of course, uh, we understand in the, all of his providence and his timing. Financial needs, God provides. Physical needs, we've seen God provide. Emotional need, we've seen God provide healing. Spiritual needs, God continually provides. E economical, God provides. Material, where houses need rebuilt or things need to come or we need things in our life, God provides. All of our needs, no matter what they are, according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. That means according to the riches of His glory, according to what is in the bank of heaven, what God can do, it will satisfy our need. And I know that only a fraction of God's work is in all of the universe. So I think if we really sit there and dwell on it for just even a fraction of a second, we could conclude that God can supply our needs. But how often the times when we, get, when we get into a funk, when we get into a trial of life, when we get into an obstacle in our way, we think that God cannot supply. That's usually the first thing that we let inside our minds, isn't it? We think God can't supply my need here. There's something here that's greater than God. But the Bible says very clearly that whatever my need is, as a child of God, specifically here in Philippians chapter 4, God will supply it in his own timing, or in his own uh, providential plan in my life. And so what about the other verse, Cody? You mentioned that you go back to Isaiah 58. Well, let's look at that for a second. Isaiah chapter 58. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in a drought, and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a water garden, like the spring of water, whose waters fail not. If you read in Isaiah chapter 58, and uh, we won't for time's sake, but maybe just a couple of verses up here. And uh, let's see. Let's go to verse 7. And, and, and it, will, it will be practical, or it'll, uh, in context, share the light of, of what verse 11 would mean. So verse 7. Is it, not a de is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, thou, that, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as a morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer, thou shalt cry. And he shall say, Here I am. 
if thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the fainter, and speaking vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones, and that shall be like the watered garden, and like the spring of water, whose waters fell not. This was a conditional, provisional promise. And so when we read in context, it's specifically a promise to the Jews, but one that God promises in Philippians chapter 4, a very same similar verse to us, but one that in context is the very same condition to a, to a Christian as well. And it's said here, if thou, uh, right here, if thou take away, in verse 9, if thou take away from the midst of thee thy, the yoke, the putting forth of the finger and the speaking vanity, then, so there's the if, then in verse 10, shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday and the Lord, etc., etc., from verse 11. So there is a if-then statement. Just as much as a conditional as you go to uh, your, your store out in Sullivan or store up in Terre Haute, if you want the items that you so desire, then you have to pay for it. And God's not asking for us to pay for the services of his supply. He is telling us, though, that there is a condition. If we walk with him, our life will be more blessed. If we walk away from him, our life will be more trialsome to our lives. God doesn't, doesn't often, uh, uh, or, or doesn't generally, I should say, or really in his intent, bless the backward Christian. In fact, really, these at the opposite occurs. There's trials that happen in our life. There's things that he tries to do to bring us back to him in the story of a prodigal son to be made mention. And so it's the exact same example if we would think in our real life where we can have running water if the, we cannot have running water if the pipe is flawed. Just like the Christian can't experience all of God's blessings if there is sin and neglecting in their life. God time over and over again shows that for specifically even provisional promises, we need to have a close relationship with him. We can't just go to God half the time or go to God one-tenth of the time or go to God ever nonchalantly when we feel like it and think that he'll just love us and by his grace and by his mercy and by all of his outpouring just so excited to see us that he wants to bless us abundantly. No, he is still God, he is still holy, and he's still just. He wants us to have a close relationship with them. And it's a great if or, or if and then condition. Walk closely with the Lord and the Lord will bless us more beyond than we could ever know. And talking about all those promises, we made mention of one and I want to highlight it and go through it a little bit more in detail. But there is also a spiritual promise as well. And the second style of promise to our need is a spiritual promise. And it is found in John chapter 6, verse 35. In John chapter 6, verse 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life, and he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Excuse me. So God is our great supplier as well, but are our great spiritual supplier as well. And so he is saying to us, we often as humans seek fulfillment in so many areas of our life. And this is what Isaiah 58 was talking about when he's saying, get rid of the yoke that you have in the world. Get rid of the vanity that you had in your life. Get rid of these things so that I can work clearly in your life is what God was telling the Jews in Isaiah 58 and what Christ is offering here in John chapter 6, that if any of us hunger, if any of us have thirst, if not a natural physical hunger, not a natural physical hunger or thirst, but a spiritual one, an emotional one, if we are lacking fulfillment in our lives, if we are lacking fulfillment in the things that we do, then we must come to Jesus. Because we often as humans seek fulfillment in so many areas of our life. We, we try to seek fulfillment in our work, we try to seek fulfillment in our lifestyle that we create. We try to seek fulfillment in our social circles that we develop around us. We try to seek fulfillment in our reputation of who we are to others. We even try to seek fulfillment in the very entertainment that we give to ourselves. But like everything else this world offers, it will only fail and disappoint you. Temporal and worldly entertainment is only, only fleeting, only, will only leave us even more hunger. Uh, more hungry and more thirsty. But God promises to those that come unto him, they will never leave hungry and will always be satisfied. 
from salvation to now and unto heaven when we sh shall see him forevermore. I think so often the case, uh, one of the downfalls of my generation and the generations coming, so long as internet and social media exist, is the hunger for acceptance. So many people do some of the most oddest, and quite frankly, can I say it with proper English, uh, dumbest things, just to gather attention to themselves. Just, I, I noticed that, uh, especially working with the youth for so many years that we have, uh, you know, they do dumb things. You give them a trash can, and they will find a way to do something dumb with the trash can, just for attention. But I think we as adults live just the same, but a little more maturely in that. We do things just for attention. We do things for acceptance. We strive out of our way, even at the cost of putting God off the throne in our lives, just for acceptance and for uh, fulfillment. But Jesus promises that if we come to him and stay with him, we'll never hunger for anything else. We'll never be thirsty for anything else in our life. He will provide. And lastly here, of course, uh, which, of course, the spiritual promise will, will give us salvation as well, and I won't neglect that. But lastly here for us as well is God promises an opportunistic promise. And I think this is one that we often as Christians stumble with, if I to be quite frankly, uh, quite frank about. Because God gives us an opportunistic promise. And what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, let me share with you the verse there. It's a long one, but uh, it's, a, it's a good one. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse, or <laughs> chapter 9, verse 10 through 11, he says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be rich, enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. And so very clearly there, you see there's an opportunistic promise there. And it is to be blessed to be a blessing unto others. It's quite simple saying. To be blessed to be a blessing unto others. I remember there was a story that was once told to me about a man who lived out in the, kind of a rural area, not so, not so much different than this. It was kind of off the beaten path, and you kind of had to drive your way over to get to him. And he was a solitude man. He, he, he was known amongst his neighbors, but he didn't quite uh, uh, talk to him or was very social about him, really. And at the same time, though, where he lived, that had terrible flash floods and terrible storms. And in this story that was told to me, or an account, rather, this, there was a huge thunderstorm coming in, and uh, of course he lived by the river, and the flash floods started happening, and the river started coming up to the street, and started getting up higher and higher and higher, and uh, that old, uh, when I think of the story in the town, but that old uh, uh, country song, Four Feet High and Rising, you know that one? It just started getting higher and higher and higher, and, and finally, he, he was a little worried about it, but folks around him were even more worried about it, and so his neighbor came by, and they were in their big pickup truck with the lift and all that and all the kids were in there and all the uh, dogs and cats were sitting up on top of the truck just trying to get out of the, get out of the storm. And they stopped by his house and they said, hey, oh, oh, Farmer Joe, he said, can you come with us and we're going to come out of, get out of here? And he said, no. He said, my family lived on this land and I know this land and this has been here for years and I'm not going to give this up. This storm will pass. And they said, all right, we're going we're gonna to leave you. And so they went and left them. And finally, the storm just kept getting higher and higher and higher, and the water just kept getting higher and higher. And finally, he had to start walking up and get to the upstairs of his house. He had a two-story house, and he had to go start getting up to the second floor because the water was already starting to get into his first floor and causing a lot of damage. And uh, his pastor came through with the boat, had one of those old flat boats, and he came over and he said, oh, Farmer Joe, he said, I knew I'd find you in your house. He said, but I, I really need to tell you, the river's starting to get really high, and we're starting to worry about you, and just come on my boat, and let's go into town. There's a nice stop, flat space up there, and we'll be all protected. And he said, no, he said, I, I'm not leaving my land. He said, God has provided for my family, and God has provided for my land. God will provide for me a way out. I know it. Pastor said, well, if there's nothing I can do for you, I'll just pray for it. And he prayed for him, and he left. And the water just kept getting higher and higher. And lastly, now he finally had to get up to his roof. And the helicopter had come through. And they had one of those searchlights. And finally, the guy on the radio on the helicopter said, Hey, old man, he said, why are you still down there? You need to go. The river's going to come up. He said, no, God's going to rescue me. I know it. 
And they said, well, we're the last person for you. If we don't get you, nobody else will. He said, don't worry about it. God's going to rescue me. Helicopter left, and unfortunately, the water got so high, his house swept over, and nobody heard the man again. But the man did go to heaven. He was a Christian, and he was madder than a hornet's nest. He went up straight to Jesus, and he said, Lord, why didn't you save me? I told everybody that you were going to save me, and, you, and I know you were a provider. Why didn't you save me? Jesus kind of stretched his beard a little bit, and he said, well, Farmer Joe, I sent your neighbor along the way, and you refused him. I sent the preacher back to you, and you refused him. And I sent that young Christian boy, and I died at his helicopter straight over your house, and you refused him. And that's kind of the end of the story. And so God provides opportunities in our lives. And sometimes we think that God's going to have this supernatural intervention and the clouds are going to split and the sun's going to come and shine red on our face and only us and angels are going to come down and assist us. But let me tell you, how often does that happen? How when's the last time you ever heard of somebody saying, say that God did that? Often enough cases... God works through the opportunities in our lives. When he blesses one in the family of God, he expects him to work through that one to be a blessing unto others. He gives us an opportunistic promise. And through that prayer, even Paul ended one of his prayers and uh, concluded with this statement that uh, is describing God in the nutshell with this. Saying, going through here, and, and I'll do the verse here. I had it. Yep. Uh, and so now unto him that is able to do it seemingly abundantly above all that we ask or thank according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without uh, end. Amen. You see, Paul was talking about and quoting and closing to the Ephesians, the God that we whom know all is, is relationships. Does he you know Christianity at, at its core? is relationship. It's a relationship restored unto, unto God. Heaven, as I've always shared with folks, is oftentimes a byproduct. Salvation was not to let Christians get unto heaven. God could have made anywhere for us Christians to dwell in, and praise the Lord, he chose heaven to, for us to dwell in. But salvation at its core was to restore the lost relationship that we had from Adam and be restored to Jesus and have a restored relationship with God. Christianity at its core is relationship, and by extension, forming relationships. So why would it come to surprise when God works through them that our aid is there as well? And so it's a challenge for us as well. As if we are blessed, how can we be a blessing unto others? But Paul does end this with this prayer, and he understood Paul knew God and had met and experienced Christ more intimately than any other Christian after him. I'm not talking about the apostles who walked with Jesus for three and a half years, if, if not longer, as uh, the apostle James and others as well, as more of his brothers. But Paul knew Jesus in an intimate way. He saw him on Damascus Road. He conversed with him. He even went up to heaven and said, I cannot utter the things that I saw. He had a, a time with Jesus, and he met Jesus more intimately, as I said, than any other Christian after him. And by his relationship, he described God as able, exceedingly able, abundantly able, and above all that we ask or think. This was, this was what God meant to Paul. God could have, or Paul could have used any number of verbs to talk about God. He could have used that God is holy, that God is love, that God is powerful, that God is the first and the last like other apostles did. But to Paul, especially in the writing of Ephesus, he was the God who was the great supplier. And that is, friends, the God that we serve. We serve a God who is the great supplier, who desires to give unto us, but yet as we as his children often do not commit to ask him daily. Perhaps there is a need in your life or a need in your family, a neighbor or friend, that you should be that person, the right opportunity, that pastor for that farmer, that friend for that farmer, the right opportunity for God to extend his abundant blessings on them. We but have to seek and ask. And the Bible says God will supply for our needs. Let's close in prayer and uh, we'll go ahead and enjoy our time with our prayers and go to the God that Paul knew as the supplier. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you again, and we thank you for your time and your word. 
Lord, we pray upon these verses. Lord, I know folks are having prayer requests, and even here at our church, we have a list of prayer requests. And every church in America, dare I say all over the world, there is people who have prayer requests. There is people who have a need, Lord, for you to intervene in their life in one way or another. Lord, there are salvations that people are praying for. There is healing that people are praying for. There is your wisdom that are pray people are praying for. Lord, there is everywhere in all that we see, people have a need of you. And Lord, I am so thankful that you are the God who is abundantly and exceedingly above all able that we ask or even think, as the Apostle Paul mentioned. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for your exceedingly amazing grace upon our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for being the promise keeper and the, such as the promise as being the great supplier in our lives. Lord, be with us now as we spend a few moments talking over our prayer request and, Lord, receiving prayer request. And, Lord, we just pray that you hear our prayers and work intimately with them in a special way as they be lifted up unto you tonight. We give, we give you thanks for all that you do and continue to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for being with us tonight in our live stream service here. And I just want to say God bless and God be with you until we meet again.